1698, London. Newgate Jail housed one of the most famous pirates ever, Captain William Kidd. As Kidd awaited trial, the chaplain of Newgate, the Reverend Lorraine, tried to get him to repent. Let us pray together, my son. Do you want to be able to face God? God will only betray me. You are not more sinned against than sinning. No. Piracy was a life for the young and dashing. By the time they were 30, the world knew of Drake and Morgan. Yet two of the most famous pirates, Captain Kidd and Bartholomew Roberts, Black Bart, started their careers as pirates when they were middle-aged. Bartholomew Roberts out of free choice, William Kidd out of confusion. In terms of the legends of piracy, the conclusion is surprising. Both Kidd and Roberts were suffering what we now think of as a midlife crisis. Kidd was born in Scotland. And what did your father do? A priest, like you. Until he was in his forties, Kidd had failed in his real ambition, to be given command of one of the great warships of His Majesty's Navy. He had married a rich widow, Sarah Ort, in New York. He had property on Wall Street and social connections. But his career had not been glorious. In 1691, he was sailing as a privateer in the West Indies. But he lacked courage, and his crew lost confidence in him. It wasn't long before they mutinied, deserted him, and stole his ship. The mutiny was led by Richard Culliford. In 1695, in London, a group of speculators wanted to finance a secret privateering expedition. Many of them were grandees and politicians. The Earl of Bellamont, the Duke of Shrewsbury, and Sir John Summers, the Lord Chancellor. They needed a captain who would keep quiet about who the men were behind this secret syndicate. Kidd was their man. He would see this as an honor and keep silent about his backers. For a tenth of any booty, King William III gave him a commission. To our trusty and well-beloved friend, Captain William Kidd, we do hereby charge and command you to capture, chase, and seize ships belonging to our enemy, France. Kidd's instructions were specific. Only French ships could be taken. The syndicate fitted out the Adventure Galley in Deptford. Kidd had waited so long for the commission that he was now puffed up with pride. It was traditional for ships to dip their colors to a naval sloop. Kidd thought that beneath his dignity. It was a mistake. The Navy were offended by Kidd's disregard of convention. While he was still in the Thames, they sent a press gang to get his best yes, men. Me. You're going to join the Navy. And if I don't want to. In New York, Kidd had to hire more men and to offer them a larger cut of the booty, 40% instead of just a quarter. The backers of the expedition, like Bellamont, complained of the quality of his recruits. Men of desperate fortunes, many with no knowledge of the sea at all. Kidd set sail for Africa. One third of the crew had died from scurvy and cholera by the time they reached the Cape of Good Hope. The ship leaked, and the crew became angry because so far they had not captured any prize. To our trusty and well-beloved friend, Captain William Kidd, we do hereby charge and command you to capture, chase, and seize ships belonging to our enemy, France. Why aren't we making for her? It's an English ship. We're here to attack French ships. We're not pirates! You couldn't command a canoe. We're gonna fire on that ship. More! No! You will obey my orders! Stop me. No!
You think you were betrayed? Yes. But you betrayed your father. You betrayed yourself. You killed a man. It was an accident. No. I can only save your soul if you face the truth. But Kidd's one decisive act was not enough to save him. As they neared Madagascar, they saw a rich ship called the Keta Merchant. Many nationalities had an interest in it. The great mogul of India owned it. The ship was carrying the merchandise of Armenian merchants. It was crewed by Arabs, and the captain was English. If you don't see, sir, then we will. I was commissioned to take French ships. Only French ships. Only French ships. Come on. Kidd had faced a mutiny before. He did not dare risk a second one. So the Keta merchant was seized and escorted by Kidd's ship into the harbor of St. Mary's in Madagascar. Kidd found there was another ship in the bay, the Mocha. It was captained by Richard Culliford who had led the mutiny against Kidd in 1691. It wasn't long before Culliford began to lure men away from Kidd. Do you think men suffer so much for nothing? You owe us. The division of spoils was agreed. Don't be ungenerous. Ungenerous captains have bad dreams. Dreams from which they never wake. Don't threaten me. What you don't give us, we'll take. With pirates. Think about it. Deserted yet again by half his crew, Kidd nevertheless pressed on, but he was terrified. The seizure of the Keta merchant had caused diplomatic outrage. The great mogul threatened reprisals against the East India Company. Worse, Britain and France had made peace, and there was now no excuse for seizing French vessels. Kidd sailed back to the West Indies, where he sold his ship and then made for Long Island, near New York. He left some of his booty for safekeeping with John Gardiner, who owned this island at the end of Long Island Sound. Then he made for Oyster Bay. He probably could have escaped, but when Lord Bellamont offered him a meeting in New York, Kidd seized the opportunity. I have the document. Here is the commission authorizing me to seize French ships. I'll pass it to the king. It's my only proof. Don't you trust me? And now, William, I have to arrest you. It's merely a formality. What kind of formality? To the king, Bellamont offered a very different version. Lord Bellamont's letter informs us that Kidd is a monster, a thief and a liar. 
and Bellamont made sure that the commission, the only evidence that could begin to excuse Kidd, was concealed. It was filed somewhere so no one could find it. It was not until 1920, 200 years later, that it was discovered in the public record office. But none of that helped Kidd. Kidd could have made embarrassing revelations, but his aristocratic backers managed to persuade him to remain discreet. Few prisoners have these privileges. Rum, ink, chocolate. I know. But why doesn't the king reply? <sighs> Jailer! The king had no intention of admitting that he had been involved in backing privateers. When Kidd came to court, he had no friends and no one to support his version of what had happened. You have been found guilty in that moved and seduced by the instigations of the devil. You did assault William Moore with a wooden bucket and did violently and with malice of forethought, strike him a mortal bruise. An accident. And why your piracy is an accident? And your theft? The sentence of this court is death. Do you want to die drunk? Yes. You want a noble death, a man at peace, resigned. I don't deserve to die. Why should I make my death easy for you? They didn't make the death easy for Kidd. He was hung here at execution dock on the Thames. The rope broke on the gallows. It took a second drop to finish Kidd. It's one of the ironies of the history of piracy that Captain Kidd, who was one of the most unsuccessful pirates of all time, should have such a secure place in myth and legend. Bartholomew Roberts was not forced to become a pirate. It was a choice he made when he was 36 years old. In 1722, Howell Davis, a pirate from Milford Haven in Wales, captured a ship called the Princess off the coast of Africa. How long have you been slaving? Ten years. Good life? Suits. For a man whose father was a fine smuggler? I could do with a good mate. I've always sailed on the right side of the law. <laughs> Roberts did not accept Davis's offer, but he continued to sail with the crew. Davis treated him rather like a novice who had to be introduced to a new way of life. The art of piracy is deception. Now I'm going to make them think I'm one of His Majesty's ships. Well, that's an old trick. It's antique, but they often fall for it. Now that a French ship in the harbour has been trading with pirates, it's immoral. On behalf of His Majesty, I shall have to arrest them. Can I trust you? No, I don't think so. Not yet. Not yet. Davis was confident and had a simple plan. He would wait through the night and then invite the governor aboard for dinner. He would clap the governor in irons and demand a ransom of 40,000 sovereigns. The next morning, Davis rode ashore to 
to invite the governor. As soon as Davis landed, he was fired upon. The Portuguese knew who he was. The noise I heard in the middle of the night was a slave swimming ashore. The noise I heard now was death. Davis's crew wanted revenge, but revenge needs to be prepared. And suddenly, though I had been an honest slaver till then, they looked to me for command. I looked into my soul. The life of a pirate meant peril and never seeing the valleys of Wales. In my mind, I saw the gallows and I saw gold. We need a new commander. There are certain conditions. The articles I will take command and they will seem strange to you. But I have always sailed under orders. The king's orders. No gambling. Candles out by eight. And on the Sabbath, we will rest. And what has usually led to pirates being caught, huh? Bad luck. Maybe. Run. There'll be no drinking after eight in the evening. Any man who wants his grog after that will have to drink on deck where others can see him. new captain did not bring them luck. For nine weeks, they didn't see a ship. Then, as they sailed round Cape Agulas, they saw 42 Portuguese ships, laden with goods and treasure bound for Lisbon, waiting, waiting to be loaded, waiting for their escort. I discovered that day I had the gift of piracy. It seemed natural to make for the smallest ship, natural to invite the captain aboard, natural to threaten to kill him unless he pointed out the richest vessel in the fleet. There's a great family, the Holy Family. I didn't know thieving would give such joy. Tobacco, sugar, hides, some 40,000 moidores minted of gold. None that I had earned and all now were mine. I especially prized a cross set with diamonds, which had been designed for the King of Portugal. Then Robert sailed into Newfoundland. He loved treasure and terror, perhaps because he had come late to his new career. The Boston newsletter noted that Roberts went to great lengths to get himself noticed. Robert's sloop went into port with drums beating, trumpets sounding. English colours flying and the pirate flag at the topmast. One cannot withhold admiration for his bravery and daring. In the Caribbean, Roberts seized 15 French and British vessels. His activities were beginning to upset the Admiralty in London. They wanted to send a squadron to destroy him. But the King had offered all pirates a pardon. The Boston newsletter reported that Robert's crew were not at all grateful. The pirates behaved like a parcel of furies. They often mocked King George's acts of grace, swearing that they had not enough money yet, but that when they had, if he sent them an act of grace, they would thank him for it. Very prettily, I'd thank him too. Make me smile. I smile at death.
When the governors of Barbados and Martinique tried to give chase to Robert's boat, he sent them a special flag which showed him standing with one foot on the head of a Barbadian and one on the head of a man from Martinique. It was said I was cruel. I was not. I believed in safety and discipline and in honest accounting among gentlemen of fortune. When we were paid ransoms, we gave receipts. Papers like the Boston Newsletter praised Robert's courage and daring, but he was increasingly handicapped by his crew. Despite all his attempts to instill discipline, they still often got drunk. The Royal Navy sent Captain Ogle in a ship called the Swallow to attack Roberts. Roberts could have escaped, but he chose to fight the Navy. Was this courage, recklessness, or, as modern psychologists might see it, a kind of death wish? One of Roberts' most famous sayings was his motto, a merry life and a short one. One of the classic signs of the midlife crisis is fear of growing old. And a good way not to grow old is to die in battle. Roberts fought dressed in a rich crimson waistcoat, which made him a target for the Navy gunners. He was hit by grape shot. His last wish was to be thrown overboard. Make me smile. I smile at death. The news of his death led to cheering in New York, London, Jamaica, and even Bombay. Captain Ogle was knighted. Those of Robert's crew who survived were tried. You are accused of the most wicked piracies and murders. Some of you claim that Roberts forced you to turn pirate. But there is insufficient evidence of this. I do not believe it. 91 of the 169 men who had been captured were found guilty. 51 were hanged. The rest were sentenced to hard labor. Kidd and Roberts were well on their way to becoming legends by the time they died. Journeys with host Lauren Miller next here on TVO.